I'm live. Good morning. It is Sunday, the 13th of October, definitely autumn, uh, and I'm reading a lot to remember. These, uh, these are reminiscences, uh, and they're centered on the lot that's a little known but uniquely lovely département of central France. These are level, two level experiences she's describing here. Uh, it's her journey. Uh, with um, she went more than once uh, with uh, Charles, her then husband, and um, also I think with Leslie. But she is recounting here. This was uh, published in 1962, I think. Um, yeah, 1962, and she dedicated it with love to Dennis and Charles, um, with love for a lot to remember. I am here already in uh, chapter three, uh, which I, it's called Phantom Prisoner, and I uh, stopped it. Um, she was describing a vision she had uh, when they were visiting a chateau, uh, which turned out they found themselves in a prison cell, or she had the vision of that. Uh, there were three Frenchmen and a German. The German was holding them. Um, and he uh, seemed very fearful, this young German. Uh, he was becoming hysterical with fear. A muscle is twitching in his left eyebrow. But none of the Frenchmen realize they're driving him too far for their own safety. Suddenly, he shrieked at them to be silent. They grin and go on raking the gravel. The gritty sounds of their raking are the only sound. Then they start whispering again. The boy's vo voice is shrill with fear as he shouts an order at them. Suddenly, one of the Frenchmen laughs. In panic, fear, the boy lets off the gun. It jerks in his hand. I can feel it jerking. The gun has become part of him, as though the bullets spurting out of it were a physical release from unbearable tension. The body of the last man to fall is gaping open, as though it had been cleft with an axe instead of by bullets. The German boy is whimpering like a dog in pain. Three of the prisoners are dead, but the youngest is trying to crawl away, dragging himself along on his elbows. Both his legs are broken. broken. The boy turns the gun on him, but does not fire it. Perhaps there are no more bullets. The boy shot himself that night. He was to be court-martialed for exceeding his orders, but that was not why he killed himself. He killed himself because he thought he was a coward, a coward who feared whispers. Pray for the soul of the German who killed Frenchmen here. Pray for the soul of the German who killed Frenchmen here. Joan! Joan, come back, Joan! Charles' voice, urgent, broke brought me back with a jerk. I sat up and saw the warder unlocking the gates to let in a party of tourists. I think he killed himself on the 24th of July, 1944, I said dazedly. I'm quite certain of the rest, but not of the exact date because you had to stop me. I nearly stopped you sooner. You kept your voice down until the last sentence which you repeated three times very loudly and in French. The warder may have overheard. He probably had, for he stared at me until we were safely in charge of one of his colleagues and had passed beyond the steel door, which was locked behind us. We were herded into a Romanesque kitchen with so many chimneys that it looked like an impossible, complicated cruet. Had I been less abstracted, I would have noticed that it was similar to the one at Glastonbury. A tourist, bolder than the rest, withdrew a few yards to take a photograph and was sternly ordered back to our pseudo chain gang. On our way to the refectory, we passed several barred gratings among the flagstones. Were convicts now suffering as had rebellious monks in underground punishment cells? These, as a contemporary record, were damp, damp lit only by a narrow barred window. 
the bed, a stone slab covered with moldy straw, in which, on a diet of bread and water, they soon became so blanched and skeletal that they seemed like spectres rising from the tomb. Pray for the soul of a German kept echoing in my brain, and did not cease its insistent beat until we came to the cloister, where, in spite of the neglect of the garden they enclosed, a fugitive peace lingered. I felt a lightening of spirit, a strong assurance that the prisoner had been set free of his ghost. Then we came to the vast abbey church, where there is no altar, and the bone-bare walls have been ruthlessly stripped of the frescoed plaster revealing the stark stone. Here there is a sense of extreme emptiness, an awareness of the deliberate withdrawal of the host. It is a shock, suddenly, to see four great tombs in their solitary splendour, and even more startling to discover they are royal tombs of the great Plantagenets of England, the loom on which is woven the tapestry that is the historical background of the lot. Here lie Henry II and his Queen Eleanor of Aquitaine. Beside them lies their son Richard I, the Lion-Hearted, and Queen Isabel, wife of his brother John, the King, who gave us Magda Carter. Henry II gave orders for his burial at Pontefort shortly before he died at Chinon in 1191. His affection for the place then probably this his affection for the place probably stemmed from the days when his aunt by marriage, Matilda, became the second of a long line of abbesses, many of whom were of royal blood. Matilda, a daughter in law of Henry the First and granddaughter-in-law of William the Conqueror, admirably fulfilled the requirements of the Abbey's Charter, which decreed that the abbess should not be a girl who from early childhood had nothing, had done nothing except sing psalms, but be a woman of the, of the world capable of understanding and directing temporal affairs, and able to thwart the malign schemes of others. Although the founder of the order, Robert d'Abrissel, lived at a time when the two commandments of Jesus had not yet become so obscured by the ten mosaic laws of the Jews, he must have been a great Christian to be able to found a community in which monks and nuns were not cut off from the opportunity of loving such of their neighbours as happened to be of the opposite sex. He took as his authority the words spoken by Christ from the cross to his mother and John. Mère voloir ton fil, fil voilà ta mère. And he told the monks to remember that the filial devotion which John gave to Mary should inspire them with similar fealty to their abbess. There were some who grumbled that the omnipotence of the women tends to create complications and difficulties, but those with clearer perception recognized that the banquets and concerts, masks and fireworks were far more pleasing to God than the sound of flesh tearing on racks or its stench from pyres which were being offered by contemporary theologians. So is it is so it is fitting that Eleanor of Aquitaine should lie here, for like the Magdalene, who is the patron saint of the nuns of Pontevaux, her virtues were loosened and her robust, her robust sins forgiven, because she had loved much. So that's the end of chapter three. The next chapter is chapter four and it's entitled Eleanor of Aquitaine.